Hello and welcome to the podcast. You're listening to Be Uncluttered. I'm Tara Tuttle and with me is Rebecca Mazzino and together we are going to help you on your journey to a life free of clutter. Hello and welcome to the podcast. This week we are talking about paperwork and actually this week and next week we are talking about paperwork because it's a pretty big topic and even maybe after two we might have more to talk about later on but the goal at the moment is to have two episodes on paperwork we'll see how we go and we're going to be talking today specifically about what not to keep and what to keep because that's a big question that comes up with clients uh, quite a bit yeah it's this is a topic that people have been asking us to do for about a year (laughs) haven't they (laughs) yeah everyone seems to even people that are that manage pretty well in terms of stuff in their house and pretty uh, generally pretty uncluttered paperwork still trips a lot of people up yeah and so everyone's different and everyone will have different challenges with paperwork but it is a really common problem and so we hope that we'll be able to give some people some help today in maybe getting a little bit more control over it okay so let's start at the start what exactly are we talking about what constitutes paperwork because straight away I think bills and mail but there is so much more what else do you think kind of falls in that paperwork category yeah well there's all the stuff like you said that you get in the mail but there's also stuff that you just bring in in other ways as well so um, cards and letters invitations uh, coupons and vouchers articles out of newspapers or maybe newspapers themselves but generally I think of articles cut out uh, as paperwork Um, magazine articles pamphlets and brochures for me one of the biggest inputs of paperwork into my house is the notes that come home from school and because I've (laughs) still got two kids in primary school the amount of paperwork that comes home even though there's online systems and I guess you know that that email thing you know is a completely separate issue and we've talked a little bit about email and controlling Mm. email as well but schools still send home a lot of forms and notes to be filled out and that Mm. oh that's huge (laughs) so those the newsletters the notes from school and then even forms to fill out yeah yeah, the and reports and stuff Mm. like that that other kind of um hard copy paperwork that comes home yep and when you said reports that reminded me as well if you know things we bring home or receive in the mail that are um, about maybe our health or other things like that so we might have medical records or resources about medical things or health related things and so there's stuff that oh, and then there's stuff that we bring home like receipts and uh, bits and pieces that we pick up when we're out uh, so there's loads of things uh, registration for our car our insurance paperwork all our legal documents, so our birth certificates, our passports, our marriage certificates, our divorce decrees, death certificates, um, legal proceedings and correspondence. Oh, and don't forget, like, the product guides and warranties <laughs> yes. and all, like, oh, there is so much paperwork. Even when you were saying certificates, like training, you know, every training course you do will send you a certificate or yes. you get an award for something or we I got stuff in the mail yesterday for my kids to say congratulations for being a mini investor and <laughs> putting money into Australian companies like uh, Vegemite and A2 or something like that and I was like okay can these go straight in the recycling and the kids are like oh well, can't we pin them on our pin boards I'm like no we didn't need these we don't need these like that just yeah. stuff comes They're from everywhere stuff, yeah. doesn't it and bank statements that's a huge one um, bank statements can take up a very large proportion of people's paper clutter and then there's all the stuff like related to your house if you um, either rent and the rental paperwork Mm -hmm. and agreements lease agreements all that kind of stuff or if you've got a mortgage um and purchase documentation did we say prescriptions as well people oh yeah prescriptions yeah that's another one and timetables and menus you know all the takeout menus oh yes (laughs) like they hang around a bit as well okay it's happening less and less thanks to like uber and uber eats and things like that where we're actually not Maybe, I don't know. I mean, I know I don't keep any 
menus from the takeaway places around the place because I, I we've lived in the same house for over 20 years and so we know what's around but we there's so much online ordering now that you don't like you can look at the menu on your phone so you don't actually need um need the the menus but they still will hang around uh, i still see them all the time uh, at clients places yeah and the um did you did you mention the user guides i think you yeah. started to yeah the they like big fat booklets <laughs> on how to use your food processor and your your little stick vacuum or whatever and they're enormous and they're they're usually what they are is they're usually like short and fat and so they don't fit into a traditional filing system or when you do put them in a traditional filing system they fill it up really quickly um so they're really annoying oh yeah so this is you and i probably have quite differing opinions on paperwork and how to handle it but this is definitely your bag you've because you've even written like a mini book on this haven't you yeah, there's an ebook on my website and we'll I'll do a, a discount. We'll talk about that at the end for the listeners if they do want to follow up with an actual um have an actual book to guide them through this, they can do so. But yeah, this is I really like paperwork and traditionally I was, you know, as any list, all the listeners would know, I'm not naturally an organized person and I had to really work it work at it and figure out a system that worked for me because I just don't have that linear brain. And so the system that I've come up with actually works for people who don't work in that linear way. So you're a bit more of a linear thinker. Mm -hmm. So you sort of, you'd be one of those people that's like, I don't understand what the problem is. (laughs) Just like file it under F for file, you know, whereas a creative person, you know, thinks very differently about that. And I'll go into more detail um, probably in our next episode about that. But uh, this system does work better for creative um, or right brain thinkers or naturally disorganized and and chaotic people or people who are a little bit more visually orientated. So um, there are different brain types that respond differently to paperwork systems and the traditional system, yeah, just doesn't work for everyone. And then you've got another two different types of people there are the people that hate keeping paper and then there are the people that um hate throwing it away so we just definitely have two camps there and you might you know you'll be on one end of the spectrum and other people will be on on the other end of the spectrum i i certainly like throwing paper out i don't like keeping it Uh, so i'm closer to you on that one but as far as the the way I organize it or the way I think about it you and I are a little bit different yeah I'm I don't I don't have a problem because I refuse to keep most (laughs) things yeah to even to the point where my latest round of the bins game I got rid of all the vertical files like we have a drawer in our desk that is set up as a like a it's got the tracks for the oh yeah vertical files. files and yeah and I was like, no, I'm not even, I don't even want them in there anymore. I can put something else. <laughs> I'll put my microphone in there instead. Um, Perfect. And because I'm like, I hate, I hate files. I don't even want the files. So <laughs> no, yeah. I don't even, yeah. I'll explain a bit more about how I keep the few things I keep, but I'm very yeah. much, paper does a not minimalist. hang around in yeah. this house. Mm. Yeah. I have a little bit, I have more than you, but uh, I do try to, to, you know, keep it fairly minimal. But there are things you have to keep, though, you know. And so that's basically what we'll talk about um, a little bit later. So we've we've kind of covered some of the things that constitute paperwork. But what, can you tell us now how it turns to clutter? Because, I mean, it obviously all comes in. Why does it become an issue? Mm. Can you kind of run us through okay. that? Yeah, well, we've just covered a few of them then, I think, when we were just chatting then. But um, decision-making anxiety can cause paper clutter. And if you if you just have, I mean, you could have a, a actual clinical depression or an anxiety disorder that does contribute to or cause decision-making anxiety. But if you do have decision-making anxiety, you will get paper clutter because it's very difficult to actually look at that paper and decide what it is that you want to do with it or whether or not it should stay or go. And um, if you do have difficulty making that decision, you will default to keeping it because that's the safer option. And so that can then cause a bit of a build-up there. Mm. Another thing is not finishing 
things. So a lot of the causes of paper clutter are similar to the causes of other clutter. But if you just half do something and then put it down and walk away, then you're going to end up with an issue later on if you continue to do that with lots of different pieces of paper. So that will cause paper clutter. Yeah, and I guess there's an issue too with, like you said, about it's being safer to keep it, that Mm. there's something about paper and stuff that's written down and that it feels like you want to keep everything for reference and if you're not sure whether you'll need it again later and a kind of like oh, am I going to regret throwing this out because mm. it's small and initially like you know one piece of paper or one yeah, document exactly. doesn't take up that much room it seems insignificant to keep it and there's no risk then that you're going to need mm. it later and not have it so but then you look at the volumes that come in Mm. And that gets out of control pretty quickly. So not being able to let go of it because of the, whether it's a fear-based thing or a risk-based thing, you know, just Mm. not being able to physically part with it, I guess that can just lead to this huge build-up. Yeah, there's a lot of fear around paperwork. And, you know, a lot of it is founded because there are some times where you can be caused a significant inconvenience by not having it. And so if you can if you can potentially save yourself that grief of maybe you know all the cost of you know maybe spending fifty dollars on getting another copy of that document that you need uh, retrieved from its source then you will try and avoid putting yourself through that and I, I can it totally makes sense it totally makes sense why there is that anxiety because sometimes you just need stuff. You just need paperwork. And I have a lot of clients that are academics and also a lot of clients that are teachers and teachers have a particular, um, af- uh, af- what's the word? Affection. Affinity. <laughs> affinity, yes. A particular affinity for resources. And and they keep them and they keep them for uh, in high volumes and for a long time. And it makes sense why because a lot of the time they've put maybe – 15, 20 hours into either creating or finding that resource. And even though they no longer need it at the moment and they're not using it, they sort of think, well, what if I do teach middle years again? I might need this. Or, well, I'm I'm teaching year two now, but what if I go back and teach kindy? Then I might need those resources again and I don't want to spend that 20 hours again making it again. So I'll just keep it for now. And that happens quite a lot. Because sometimes things are hard to find and are time-consuming creating and once you've got them, you, you want to hang on to them. So teachers and academics definitely uh, hang on to their stuff uh, a little bit more than, than other people. And there's also the people that love information generally yeah. and yeah. collect. Like for me, for years and years, it was about recipes And every (laughs) recipe I saw in any home magazine, any Woman's Weekly, I may have even been known to tear one out of the magazine in the doctor's clinic once or twice. (laughs) Really quietly, so no one can hear you. Like, like, just do it gradually. (laughs) Or you cough while you do the really quick rip. Get the kids to, like, go and press the button on that noisy toy while I rip out this (laughs) trifle recipe. Um, But so, and that was the thing. So that, for me, was an issue for a while because I was, I wanted to, collect the recipe so you get people that are really into um uh, yeah it could be something around around a hobby or a particular Mm. bit of research they're doing or it could be just a point of interest or Mm. I know my um nana used to cut out every article in the local paper that referred to um the netball club and friends of mine and stuff and she would cut them all out and then the next time she sent us something she'd send me all these clippings but she'd do that for all the grandkids and kids and Mm. um so there are people that just become those kind of information junkies that collect those bits of paper as well which is fine when they make it into some kind of system to deal with but when you're in the collection phase that can become quite yeah overwhelming and, and create a bit of clutter yeah, if it comes in and just sits there, then mm. it can be a problem. If if it if it moves on, like you know, your grandmother did move things on, so yeah. she sort of didn't. It didn't sort of build up in the house. But I have many many clients who are, you know, those people. I, I love these people because they're they're so passionate, and enthusiastic, and interesting. But they just are interested in everything, you know, mm-hmm. and they get kind of like almost David Attenborough or Steve Irwinish about things, you know, like they're 
they're sort of really intense and passionate and and fascinated by everything and when you're fascinated by everything then you will collect a lot of articles on stuff and a lot of my clients do that because everything interests them and and they they want they don't want to lose that that little nugget of information and then there are the people that don't necessarily don't necessarily collect things because they're interested in it but they collect it because they think somebody else might be Mm. It might be somebody they know or or something like that. And so they collect it all and they go, oh, well, this, I'll, I'll give this to my brother. You know, I, I did have a client and this is a bit more of a, a, a sad note, I guess. Uh, but I did have one client who collected newspapers to to the point of not being able to live in the house. So that's how much it built up. And there were several complex factors contributing to the hoarding situation. But one thing she said to me broke my heart and she said, my brother died. And if, if what if I had found the article that could have saved his life? Like (gasps) what if the information had have come and I read it and I could have sent it to him, you know, and she really she really re- like regretted she collected all the newspapers but didn't get around to reading all of them and she really had this idea that if she because of what had happened with her brother that if she kept collecting and she kept um gathering information that perhaps maybe she could help somebody who needs it and yeah it was really sad but it That's was heartbreaking yeah yeah and she she i don't know she just lived with that regret that she hadn't read the right article that could have saved his life and um, it was, yeah. It was There's something sad. in that whole article collecting thing that it feels like, and certainly for me with the recipes, it felt like the potential missing of an opportunity. Like mm. it's like if I don't get that recipe now, one day that will be the perfect recipe for me to cook for yeah. Christmas lunch. And if I don't have that, what am I going to use? Well, as it turns out, I've got... 20 other recipe books and there's the internet as well yeah. if I really need but to But that doesn't looking. stop the fear, does it? But All it's that, that, that whole thing idea, of you look FOMO. at something and you go, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. FOMO, you nailed it. I, like I couldn't quite articulate it, but it's that whole idea of if I don't keep it, then I then I I have no awesome, access yeah. to it in the future and, and I don't want to miss out. I don't want to lose the opportunity should mm. I require it. And so I think there's lots of that. And even mm. around the the fear of chucking stuff out and needing it later just always seems like for anyone that's a bit risk averse, just nice, safe, easy option. Just keep it, just keep it all. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And that's, Mm. that it's more comforting that way. But yeah, the the FOMO thing is really real. And, you know, and I was actually just reading, someone posted something recently about in one of my decluttering groups actually it might have been it was in the big uncluttered community actually someone posted about books and I think someone commented and I apologize to the person who said this with their lovely insight that I can't remember their name but they said you know what if that book has is the key to a better me Mm. and I think you know the same thing can happen with articles magazine and newspaper articles is what if the the key to the better me is in there and I miss out on that and I I miss that opportunity to become a better person or a better version of myself or improve my life and so yeah you can see why people keep things that it's 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 real the fear Mm. and and I guess then going on from that like we said it's not the collecting itself is not the issue and even the keeping paperwork to some extent Mm. isn't as big an issue as not having a system to deal with it then. Yeah, yeah. Either a system, well, both, both a system of flow Mm -hmm. of how the paper moves through the home and then a system of storage of of how it sort of stays and and the homes that it has and the boundaries that you have around those homes in in your house. So I have read your ebook and I loved it and I loved this analogy that you talk about with water. Can you... Tell mm. everyone about that because that kind of crystallizes in my head the way ideally paperwork would move through a house. Yeah. So I always say to clients, if you think about your paper as water, what you want is a creek or creek flowing through your house, not a bunch of stagnant ponds. And
and we actually do end up with stagnant ponds all through the house uh, under the bed in tubs shoved in the spare room in you know plastic bags and stacked up high on top of the filing cabinet inside the filing cabinet and we have this static uh yeah ponds of stagnant paperwork because ideally it would come in in whatever means it does meander through you know meet its objective you know we do whatever the call to action is with that piece of paperwork and then it eventually makes its way out and whether that Mm. be out uh of the house the same day it comes in because it's actioned and it's finished it might be it goes out you know seven years later when you can let go of your your items after you don't need to keep them for tax records it doesn't necessarily have a time limit on it but the idea is that it comes in we do something with it it stays around as long as it needs to but then it does leave there's no Mm. stagnant pond at the end that it gets blocked up in um yeah i I love that it just yeah the image for me kind of works yeah because we do want paper flow we don't want um we don't want yeah just it all sticking around and filling up our house and filling up our brains so another a few another couple of causes of paper clutter are um, perfectionism and perfectionism Mm -hmm. often prevents people from setting up a system in the first place because they have this idea of a perfect system but it's a really complex or large system and they don't have time to set it up so they don't sort of set it up at all Uh, so that can cause paper clutter and having too much in your schedule so not giving yourself or not allocating yourself space to manage your paperwork in your day in your daily schedule Uh, and I don't mean like sitting down for two hours a day and dealing with your household paperwork but just that that space between bringing your um, mail in and starting dinner you know there is no space between walking in the door and starting dinner for you to put the mail in an appropriate spot so that can cause paper clutter as well yeah and I guess the more you have going on in your life the more hobbies, the more extra curricular activities your children have, the more clubs you're in, the more community mm. groups you're a part of, the yeah. more paper clutter you're going to get, aren't you? You know, like yeah, exactly. Yeah, the more the more you the more interests, the more hobbies, the more commitments you have. Uh, generally, the more paper you'll have as well. Mm. And then my favourite thing to do procrastinate um that can lead to dealing with it too because yeah sometimes it's just like yeah i just uh, i'm gonna find something better to deal with in my paperwork yeah. today yeah i'll just stick this on the pile over there and i'll deal with it later mm-hmm. and that later pile gets all muddled up and becomes a an overwhelming um upsetting kind of activity in your mind and then of course as soon as it gets overwhelming you you avoid it even more Mm. okay well so let's let's get to the nitty-gritty then what can you tell us Beck? what paperwork should we be keeping and what should we be get letting go can you just give us okay (laughs) talk to us about that around that that idea obviously there isn't a definitive list that everybody should get oh, sorry that's what i you know. need i could make millions selling that definitive list couldn't i <laughs> yes but there isn't because everyone's different everyone has different circumstances and of course every country every state every county every regency whatever it is that you live in every city possibly um could have different rules around the legalities of certain paperwork so there are no um hard set rules for example i i noticed you said seven years when you talked about tax just before Mm -hmm. now in australia we only have to keep five years of our tax records from the date Mm -hmm. of lodgement and seven years is a common misconception and people say to me all the time they say no it's seven and i'm like no it might have been seven in the 70s and the 80s and it's seven in america (laughs) But it's five in Australia, the tax office says so, you know, on on their website. And they, the tax office recommends we keep five years, uh, keep our, all of the documents relating to our tax returns from, for five years from the date of lodgement. So if you're the type of person that often puts your tax in three years late, then as far as calendar years go, you'll end up keeping them for 
eight years past the date of the tax return. So if you put in your 2010, 2011 tax return in 2014, you need to keep them till 2019. Does that make sense? And that so does make that's sense. the yeah, so that's the Australian rules and they only review back so their review period and they use the word review because everyone's scared of audit but what they mean is audit. So their review or audit period only usually goes back 3 years. So they're very unlikely to audit you for the other the other 2 years, but you still have to keep them anyway or they recommend that you keep them. So that's and but within that there are complexities. So there are certain investments that you do need to keep records for more than five years for. So this is where it all becomes complicated. And someone like me, a layperson, giving advice on what to keep from a financial perspective is really dangerous. So I always say to people, this is what I know generally. And with that knowledge, take that to your accountant and say to them, can you give me a definite list? Tell me what it is that you want me to keep and for how long. And once you have that from your accountant or if it's on legal matters from your lawyer, then you have something there to guide you. And you also have something to back you up if you get into trouble. (laughs) Because if your accountant says you only need to keep three years worth, and you do, and then the tax office comes back and says, oh, we want to audit you for the period five years back, and you say, I don't have any of it, and you get into trouble, then you can say, my accountant's insurance can pay for that. (laughs) Fine, because Mm. they told me three years. So you've got something to back you up. You've got to get something in writing um, and it will uh, also so back you up and it will guide you as well. So I always say ask an accountant and you will find you'll get different things from different accountants. I have had accountants tell me to keep seven years worth and then I have had other accountants tell, to, uh, tell me to keep five years worth. So the, those accountants that are telling me to keep seven years worth are obviously thinking of things outside what the tax office generally does for regular people. And so they're kind of backing themselves a little bit by saying, look, just keep seven years just in case. So if you have an accountant, then get them to to tell you what it is. If you don't, then talk to the tax office and get them to tell you what it is that you need to keep or have a look on the, web, the website because the website, the ATA website is quite good. Um, and if you're in America, it's a different situation or in another country, um, check out your your state laws your uh, and your country's laws around keeping things for tax and legal reasons so that's you know a chunk of our paperwork but like we talked about before there is so much that falls outside of that Mm. so do you have any kind of principles or guiding advice around you know other stuff to keep and to let go it's all about Okay, it's all about personal comfort levels, but within that, we also have to think about the amount of space that we have. And, you know, there might be, and everyone's got a different combination of how much paper they're comfortable with and how much space they have. So you might have no space, but want to keep lots of paper. That's not going to work. They're not com- compatible. Um, or you might be, you know, comfortable keeping everything um, and you've got loads of space. So they are compatible and you can then work with your your sort of instinct. But most people have more paperwork than they have space for, especially well, my clients anyway, and perhaps people reading and listening to this um, podcast as well, would have more paper than space. And that's why they're interested in listening to this podcast. And so in that case, you've got an incompatibility. So you need to think about uh, reducing the amount of stuff that you keep. There's, um, you know, the old 80-20 rule, 80% of what we file is never looked at again. It's never looked at again. And so we go to all this trouble of setting up filing systems and meticulously filing paperwork that we actually never look at again. And the only time we have to see it is when we're doing a clean out. It's like, oh, I forgot I had this. Yeah, see, that's why I keep moving because I hate moving paperwork. So every mm-hmm. time we move, I chuck all that stuff out. Mm-hmm. And now I've got to the point where I just don't even keep it in the first place. But mm-hmm. it is interesting because people can have a great system but the problem is once it goes in, it stays in mm. and then it doesn't yeah. come out. There's yeah. no – if they don't have a review section at the end of their system that after, you know, a certain period of time they go through some some files yeah. and let go of what they don't – haven't needed, haven't used. Yeah. Obviously the best way to manage it is to really think hard before you bring something in in the first mm. place. 
you know, if someone hands you a flyer when you're walking along the street, just don't take it. You know, that's that prevents you having to find a place for it later. And, you know, yes, there's the people that will go, oh, my God, what if that flyer was the thing that could change my life? Yes, but what if it isn't as well? <laughs> and so, you know, you, you can just – what you don't know won't hurt you. And so if you sort of say no thank you to that flyer, that coupon, that brochure, whatever it is, you don't need to bring it in. You know, when you when you go and buy – if you duck into the supermarket and grab a Coke and a packet of chips, you know, say no to the receipt. You, you, you're not going to want to return them. And unless you, you're putting them on your work expenses, you don't need the receipt. And so, you know, there's there's little things like that that you can prevent things coming in in the first place. Uh, sign up for, um, if, if you have an appropriate system that works for you, but sign up for um, digital bills and digital information instead so that you can – stress out over your digital clutter instead of your paper clutter well see that but that's a really good point because i used to hate gas and electricity bills and then i'd think oh how long should i keep them for do i need to keep them surely the gas company or the electricity company has a record of Hmm. what my usage was and um you know because if we're working at home and then we claim that you know a percentage of our household energy costs are used for working at home you know, all that kind of stuff. And then I just rang because we switched to online billing, which is great. It meant I didn't have the paper clutter. And I rang them and I said, if I needed to get my usage from you five years ago for this period of time, do you keep it on record? And they're like, yep. I'm like, great. Mm -hmm. So now I don't even keep the emails. So Mm. occasionally one quick phone call, like, yes, if you can turn it from paper to digital, awesome. But also, if you are not sure about whether you really need to keep it, you can call them. One quick call now might save a mm. box of paper in the next 10 years, yes. you know. Yeah, um, a box of paper and four hours sorting that paper. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. So if we think about all the other types of paperwork that we talked about earlier, if we just what I might do is go back through a couple of those and talk about you know, how long maybe you could keep things or some suggestions on how long you should keep things. Because like you said, with the bills, uh, in reality, and I'm talking about from a regular person, not someone with seven businesses and 25 properties and three yachts, but a regular person, if you're thinking about the, the, the bills that we pay and whether we need to keep them or not, there's a few things to consider. So one is obviously, have you used or are you claiming that on your tax so if you use uh, if you claim if you work from home which a lot of people are at the moment if you work from home uh, in Australia you can uh, I think claim a proportion of your internet supply off your tax so you can have a tax deduction from your internet so you would need to keep that bill as part of your tax records for at least five years from the date of the tax tax return was lodged if you have claimed those expenses on your tax so but if you don't work from home and you haven't used them for tax reasons then the other reason that you would keep them was if you wanted to track your spending track your usage perhaps or just keep a record of your account number or something like that so you don't actually need to keep them unless there's a legal reason and the rest of the the other reasons are all personal personal comfort you know do I need this information or am I going to try and find this information later for any reason And if you can't find the information anywhere else, then it would make sense to keep at least one bill. But if you can, like you said, then there is no reason because it does exist elsewhere. And so you just have to go through that thought process of all these bills that I'm paying. If I'm not claiming them on my tax, why am I keeping them? Mm. What's the reasons? And do I really need to keep them? I usually recommend to clients if if it's not tax – um, then most of your household bills you either keep for the life of the item itself. So let's say you get uh, a household bill that is a pest control, for example. That one would probably be worth keeping more than um, a two-year-old electricity bill because pest control provides evidence of the date that you had your pest control. It could have a warranty involved with it. It's a maintenance thing. Um, So that would make sense to keep that one. Whereas your electricity bill from two years ago, you've paid it, it's done, it's dusted, you didn't claim it on your tax. There's absolutely no reason to keep that one. Yeah, so I guess that the the principle then is that if you can find it again elsewhere on the internet or from the provider then Mm. you don't need to keep it yeah yep 
if you can find it again or if you even or if you even have a digital copy yourself yeah and we're not even talking about digitizing in this we could do an episode on how to digitize your household paperwork system as well but we're not even talking about that we're just talking about physical paper today but you know if you have a digital copy you do not need to keep the paper copy which is so funny actually that you just mentioned pest control because this happened yesterday to me oh wow <laughs> is that really? we had um we get plenty of spiders around our house and so we get usually in spring get the boundary of the property and a you know whatever sprayed um for no spiders and they give a one-year warranty and so but because I don't keep paperwork (laughs) when I paid I take a quick photo of the receipt and then I chuck it Mm. And then um, yesterday, my husband walks in with a red back spider that has dropped from a heating vent in our ceiling, <laughs> like oh. into in our lounge room. So oh, no. for any of you um, folks that are in the US or the UK, red back spiders are lethal and they're, yeah. t- they're, they're pretty tardy, but they're pretty deadly. And I definitely wouldn't want one in the house, not with kids <laughs> and a dog around or us either, I guess. But I'm like, okay, this pest control place had a, has a 12-year warranty and they say if you find any pests within that period, they'll come back and respray. And I was like, okay, hang on, where did I keep – did I keep anything? And I'm like, of course I didn't keep – I never keep that stuff. But I <laughs> was like, I remember I got it done at the beginning of September, scroll back in my phone, there's a photo of the thing. And so then I just forwarded it, that picture to mm. them on the email and said, look, this is when it happened, this is what the scenario is. Took a photo of the redback spider as well. Here's my proof <laughs> that there's a spider in my house. Um, but, yeah, it's that whole thing of if you if you think there's a reason to keep it and, yeah, okay, I don't want to encourage people to keep seven bazillion photos on their phone of every piece of paperwork. Yeah. Well, um, I would recommend you don't take photos and keep missed photos generally. Like you've done it and it works for you. But I certainly – it wouldn't work for me because I don't have a huge storage on my phone. So what I do is I use the Dropbox app and I scan – yeah. Um, scan them straight into Dropbox because then they don't get muddled up in my phone. Because if you've got, uh, you've got, no, oh, you don't have an iPhone, do you? See, yeah, I do. I, yeah. Oh, you do. I. Oh, how come when we message, it's not through iMessage? Or well, maybe it is, and I'm just thinking of someone else. Um, but with iPhones, like the way that I that Apple manages photos is atrocious. Like it's really bad. And so if you've got an iPhone, you might find that you have difficulty retrieving photos sometimes. They might just disappear. You might have you might have to pay for cloud management because you can't get it off your phone any other way, all that kind of stuff. So I always sort of say um, try to, if you do take a photo of it, save that photo somewhere else or email it to yourself and then just like get rid of it off your phone because like you said scrolling through three months worth of photos for some could mean scrolling through two and a half thousand photos to find yeah. the thing that they wanted so if you do if you do have um photo clutter issues then that wouldn't be that wouldn't work and you're better off yeah taking the photo sending it to yourself somehow or uh, saving it to a cloud-based uh, filing system so it's a little bit easier for you to retrieve sorry i took you wildly off track no, but that was that was an exa- it was a good example. I had a, an episode with a spider yesterday as well. So a client and I were doing the garage, and we I and I wasn't because it's a really clean garage. I hadn't even sort of thought of spiders. Like we in inside the shed, there weren't really any spider webs. Like she just kept it really sort of clear of, of spiders. But she had kept a lot of plastic sheeting to cover up her tubs and things to keep the dust out and um and things like that and so I just sort of pulled these massive big piles of plastic out and just shoved them out in the backyard until we'd finished you know getting rid of the rest of the stuff and then I picked something up off a big bundle of plastic and there was this massive white tail and Mm -hmm. I'm not exaggerating when I say it was like the size of my thumb and and a white tails are worse than red packs. <laughs> like, mm. like, you know, and all the Americans are like, this is why we wouldn't live in Australia. And like, and I've just gone, oh, oh, gosh, like, look at the size of this spider. And then I had to work out, like, because it was on top of a pile of plastic, it, would cr- it was crushable, but it was relatively stiff. And then it was on top of a tub that didn't have the lid on properly. So if I wanted to stamp my foot down on it, I would have gone straight through, broken the lid of the tub right down into the bottom and might not have even killed the spider. So we had to manoeuvre it <laughs> so that it was over something hard so I could stomp on it. And Oh, it was awful. See, this <laughs> is the reality 
of professional organisers that you don't <laughs> yeah. see on the home edit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, massive big white tail, and the client and I sort of hovering around it, going, "Okay, how are we gonna how are we gonna work this?" You know, um, it's sort of yeah. Was, luckily, she wasn't scared of spiders. I've I've got some clients that are terrified of spiders, and when I thought about some of my other clients in that situation, they would have been sort of you know, in the fetal position on the other side of the property um, saying, make it go away. Um, but this, this client, was she was pretty cool and calm. And so both of us we were like, okay, we've got to work something out here. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we're not talking about spiders. We're talking about <laughs> yeah. So all of the people with arachnophobia out there, you can come back now. We're, we're going to stop talking about them. Um, so where were we up to? So we're talking about things that it's not worth keeping. So we said mm. stuff that you can find again um, – either from the originator or stuff that you might be able to, I guess stuff that you can find on the internet. So like you said before yeah. about menus from your local takeaway places, if you can find them online, don't keep the hard copy, let it go. Mm. Yeah. What are other things that we should let go of? Okay. I think the FOMO is a big one to talk about. I think letting go of the idea that we have time to read all those articles again, that we have time to send them to the 1,700 people that we want to send them to, that we have time to cook all of the recipes that we want to cook. Uh, I think letting go of the idea that keeping this piece of paper is somehow going to change your life can help reduce the paper clutter. And I think not keeping something that if you sort of think about the stuff you've kept in the past and how much of it you've gone back to retrieve or look for, um, then try and keep just that percentage. Don't try and keep all of it. Just sort of say, well, I've only ever retrieved 20%. So of all the things I want to keep, I'm just going to keep, you know, a, a proportion of them, not not all of them. Mm. For me, the, the recipe thing, it, I started to, instead of sticking them in my scrapbook, straight away when they were like physical recipes I would just slide them in the cover and then I kind of have a tradition around Christmas where I will sit down and cut out all the recipes and stick them in my book but so I would if I hadn't used any of them between ripping them out and the sticking at Christmas I would chuck them out because Ah, that's a good idea because I'd think oh yep I remember that recipe for whatever and I'd go through the loose ones and if I cooked it, firstly, if it was terrible or it was hard to cook, then I would chuck it out. But, um, yeah, if I didn't go looking for them before it came time to stick them in, then they would go. So that was kind of my get out of jail yeah. free card kind of exit yeah. strategy. And you, you know, you were doing something that fitted with the theme of your life as well. And and a lot of the time what we what people will do is they'll collect things and they will keep them because it's part of something they're interested in at the time. And then in three or four or five years' time, they look at that and go, well, I have to keep this because I got it for a reason. You know, it's interesting. But that's they're not that person anymore and they're even less likely to retrieve it as time goes by. And so if you look at, at the things that you've got and think, is this, is this me? Is this relevant to my life right now? You know, for example... If you had an accident and you had um, problems with your shoulder and it, you know, let's say you broke your shoulder and you had to have surgery on it and then you had to have physio on it and it took up sort of 18, 12 to 24 months of your life of, you know, medical records and resources and all that. And then you find, you know, an exercise chart from the physio saying do this exercise yet your shoulder is okay now or you've moved on to a different injury that you're worried about then that's not part of who you are anymore you know you don't need to do that exercise anymore because you've moved on to other exercises or something like that and so you know looking at this saying is this me now and is it relevant to my life right now and will it be relevant to my life in the future and um, if not it it could go Mm. yeah I like that um what about things being out of date? So I mean, many things. A no-brainer, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And and so, warranties, especially because yeah, <laughs> you know, like I found one not that long ago for the last washing machine I had, which was before we moved to the UK. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, maybe yeah. ten, fifteen years ago, like yeah, crazy. But because the warranty got filed in my meager filing system, mm. it stayed. And um, I'm like, we don't even have that washing machine. 
Yeah, and that's it. when I do, whenever I go looking for a warranty, I have a little bit of a cull at the same time because, yeah, things go out of warranty period. Like, you know, things might have a one to five year warranty. And once you've had it for, you know, a year after the warranty has expired, uh, it doesn't really, it's not really as relevant anymore. It can still be somewhat relevant. And I have, we could do a whole, I could do a whole um, episode on ranting about this, but as far as Australian consumer law goes, warranties um, aren't the be-all, end-all, and you might have a one-year warranty on something, but if you can prove that the uh, item should have lasted longer than it did, then you can still get your money back or you can still make a claim. And um, so often, you know, I will say to people, just keep the receipt for a bit after the warranty or for as long as you think you, this thing should last. So an example is a hair straightener, right? I had a hair straightener that lasted me like eight years and then it died and so I went and bought another one and then that one lasted 13 months. The warranty was 12 months. So I went into the store where I bought it from and I said, uh, the, my hair straightener has stopped working. And she said, well, the warranty's for 12 months. And, you know, and I had the receipt with me. She said, the warranty's for 12 months. And I said, well, under consumer law, <laughs> and I think I saw her eye, like, eyes roll back into her head as soon as I said those words. I said, under consumer law, I'm actually entitled to a refund if something has a major fault and that, that I would not have bought it if I'd known that it would happen when it happened. And basically our laws in Australia say that if something should should reasonably be expected to last a certain amount of time we can request a refund if it doesn't and I ended up having that particular hair straightener I ended up having three of them replaced by warranty because they all lasted under 18 months um, each and each of them was outside its 12-month warranty when it died but I kept getting new ones so it's sometimes worth keeping your evidence of uh, purchase of items longer than the warranty period but no longer than you would expect it to actually survive Mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah yeah. And I think along with that goes the product manuals as well. Because I remember, you know, even things like kids' bikes or whatever or um, some bit mm. of technology that we've purchased, like our Apple TV box. Well, we don't even use that anymore. But unless I specifically was looking in that section of my warranty and user manual um, filing area, I wouldn't mm. kind of think, oh, oh, I must go and get that out now that we don't use that anymore. Think You just yeah. stop using things, you just let stop them using go. Things. But yeah. quite often you forget to let go the product manual yeah. and the whatever yeah. else. So I actually recommend clients don't keep user manuals at all anymore because, and what I'll say is when you're going through your paperwork, if you see a user manual for something you still have, but it's a big, fat, annoying space hog, then Google the, the product from what you know in your head, not from what you can see on the user manual, but Google the product from what you know in your head. So what you see on the product, any serial numbers that you can find, anything like that. Google it. If you can find the user manual by a quick Google, then throw out the physical one. Because mm-hmm. yeah. they're, just, they're just big fat space hogs. And like you said, you don't ever go and get them anyway. <laughs> like, I actually, I, I sat down with my the user manual for my, um, my new car uh, yesterday because I couldn't work out how to change the clock. I'm like, I... I was like doing, I tried about four or five times without the manual. And I'm like, sure, I'm not, I'm an intelligent person. Surely I can work out how to change the clock <laughs> on my car. And I'd worked out how to change the one on the display screen, but not the one on the dash. And it was so annoying. I had to sit down with the user guide and do it. And it was like, yeah, so I needed the, but I could have Googled for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So user manuals, if you can get yeah. it online, let it go. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Um, also get rid of stuff that's that's a bit had it you know if you've got if you've got paperwork that's got mold on it get rid of it if you've got paperwork that's you only got half a document you know get rid of it you don't need to to keep half documents they're they're pretty useless yeah and i guess um a few ideas to like we talked about before about saying no to brochures and stuff if we can reduce what comes into our house then we reduce what we have the need to organize then or deal with. So what are mm. what are a few things that we can keep in mind to bring less in? Okay. Um, don't print stuff unless you have to. So I've had several clients who print all their emails oh. and that's – and I can understand. I can absolutely understand because I like – if I need to review a document, 
I can only do it on paper. I'm really bad at reviewing documents on screen. So I like to have a pen with me so I can write and I don't know, it's got, I, I don't know, it's something to do with my brain. But I know a lot of other people are the same and reviewing documents and making changes and edits is often um, best done on paper for some people. But that said, if you don't have to print it, don't. Whatever you can avoid printing, avoid it unless you, you know, you can only do the job with a printed version. Mm-hmm. And emails, if you've got a digital copy, don't don't print your email. Yep. And what about if there's digital things or articles you find online or whatever mm. that you want to that you want to keep or bookmark for later? Yeah, so there are digital ways to do that. You know, you can use something like Evernote or OneNote to to save it because often you know if you find something if you find a resource on the internet there is the anxiety that you will forget what you were searching for and so you can't find it again later when you do want it uh, or that they might remove that resource so you can um, take a copy or save it as a pdf or um, put it into evernote or something like that instead of printing it and then having it take up space in your filing cabinet to possibly be never looked at again. Another reason for digitizing it is as well is that you can um, easily search for it in your files. So things like things that your resources that you're printing off the internet will be much easier for you to find if you simply save it somewhere on your computer rather than than print a copy. Mm. Like you mentioned before, I guess you can reduce paper by scanning and storing stuff online Mm. or like I do which is now I'm realizing probably not ideal take photos of some of the stuff that you do if it works for you it's fine and that's the thing it will work for some people I just wanted to make sure that anyone who it didn't work for had yeah option and because I'm quite a chronological thinker I think we talked about this yeah um well, you were talking about it in terms of photos, I think, and your mum and the way she thinks of, oh, yes, well, you know, with when the you, Chantel, with the episode with Chantel. Yeah, yes. that's right. Mm. Um, and so I will think, I can remember that it was the first week of September that the pest control guy was here or mm. I remember that um, Sienna got her braces on in the last week of May. So the yeah, pa- see, I would remember that. But so, and because I think like that, it's really easy yeah. for me to search by month in my phone, mm. in my photos yeah. and that kind of stuff. Um, but if I'd you, have to scroll through all of them. Yeah. yeah. If you're not that kind of chronological thinker, Thinkable. then then that might yeah. not work. Or if you have a poor, just a poor shot memory anyway. So I am a chronological thinker, but I have a poor memory. Yeah. So uh, I wouldn't be able to, I do think chronologically, but I can't remember the specific dates things happened. So Mm -hmm. uh, very annoying that is. Um, I guess as well saying no thank you (laughs) to all the paperwork offered to you while you're out. Like you said, receipts, brochures. Yep, yep. And put a no junk mail notice on your mailbox uh, so that you don't get as much stuff coming in. Oh, and, and if, here's another thing which, we should have mentioned when we were talking about articles before, but if you have an overwhelming amount of magazines and newspapers that you want to go through to find articles of interest in before you dispose of them, then stop buying them until you've finished with those piles. Mm, because cancel your subscriptions, stop buying the newspapers until you have caught up on your backlog because you will have it coming in faster than it's leaving and you're never going to actually get ahead yeah sounds good and I guess just set boundaries then as well around around if you're collecting articles or you're collecting items you know only as much as will fit in that basket or that space yeah, exactly. or your in tray or whatever it is yeah or that file you know you can have one suspension file on forest bathing and you can have one suspension file on jacaranda trees and that's it you know you can't have three you know and mm-hmm. or you can say i can have three suspension files on my interests and that's all and once i've filled that with articles of interest i need to go through and cull some and um, or digitize or read them again and you know, decide whether or not I need the information after another read, that kind of thing. Right. So hopefully this has helped you. <laughs> and I can't believe we've talked for so long about just yes, what paperwork is and what to keep. 
next week's organising episode might be four hours long. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. Well, we, that, we, if we cut the spider talk out, <laughs> that would probably that might reduce it by ten minutes. Uh, ten minutes worth of scaring people. Um, yes, we did talk a lot about that. This was longer than we thought it would be. So hopefully it has been helpful for people to just sort of get in their, straight in their minds what it is that they actually want in their homes paperwork-wise and what they can survive without. And if you've got a comment to make about paperwork, what you keep, what you let go of or the way you store it, please come join us in our Facebook community and share all about how you manage or don't manage your paperwork in there. And we'll be back to finish the discussion next week. Thanks for joining us. We'd love it if you'd leave a review or tell all your friends about us so that they too can be uncluttered. If you'd like to connect with us, you can find us at beuncluttered.com.au or on social media or on our own websites at clearspace.net.au and basklifecoaching.com.